Hello, hello, hello. Everybody hear me okay? Uh, I'm a bit statuesque up here. I feel like I'm blocking the TV, so just tell me if I need to move or do I need to sit? Whatever, you know, I don't want anybody to miss out on seeing anything. All right, so hello, hi, thank you for coming to the Homestead Festival. Hope everybody had a wonderful weekend full of knowledge, saw some good talks, uh, sat in on some good talks, saw some great demonstrations, definitely a lot to be seen. So I'm just, for a warning, uh, I am incapable of being vague and so I am packing a lot of material in here. I am very likely going to go over, but I got permission that it's fine. I can go all the way to five if I want to. It will not go that long, but uh, it will definitely go a bit over an hour for sure. So. Uh, for those that, can you hear me okay? I feel like, okay. So for those of you that do not know me, my name is Kate St. Cyr. I am online as the modern day settler. I live in New England, uh, so I am currently dying because it is 61 degrees back home. Uh, and I have a small homestead, very much my mantra is we maintain our own breeding stock. We breed our, breed our own supply of animals for our consumption. We have also, over the years, um, gotten into our own butchering. We are not the best, but you know what? We're learning and we're not afraid to do a bad job. We still eat the meat, even if it isn't looking the prettiest as far as the chops go. Uh, and one of the my passions, I guess I would say, uh, many passions, but one is pigs. I love them. I love my sows. I am very much into breeding. Um, I personally breed for the purpose of selling wieners to local farms. So there are whether local farms homesteads, whatever it may be. So I provide piglets to people to grow out for them to raise for their own family, also to farms who are not a farrow to finish operation. They buy the wieners from me, they raise them, take them to butchering, sell them in their CSAs, sell them in their storefronts, whatever it may be. So that that is what I'm all about. I'm not a meat producer unless it is for myself. Um, I don't like to raise meat for other people. I don't like the responsibility that goes with that. But I am more than happy to provide you with your wiener, your piglet to raise yourself. So, uh, I just a quick little backstory. I and kind of where I am at today. So I currently have six active breeders. I have three gilts that are confirmed pregnant gilts. So this is going to be their first litter. They're all due the first half of August. I also have three seasoned sows that were bred two weeks ago, so I will know if they are pregnant next weekend. Um, so that is the current herd size that I keep. I started with one epically disastrous guilt, uh, and she is the one that all of my breeding stock has actually stemmed from over the years. I have scaled up as I've become better, uh, better at selecting genetics, um, better at establishing a customer base, giving me a higher demand, and it has allowed me to scale up, so to speak, from you know a one sow, two sow type thing, currently up to six. I'm all about slow growth as it is warranted, uh, and that's the point that I am at today. So my goal for this whole talk is, there. this is why I did not say how to have a profitable homestead farrowing because there is no magic formula. It does not exist. You could do the exact same thing as I do and rinse and repeat and you may have completely different results. But I want to give you a true, honest look at the potential costs and ways to cut them as well as the reality and the risk that goes with farrowing. Um, I am not trying to <laughs> scare or discourage anybody, but I am very much a, 
I want to be hit between the eyes with the truth. If I'm like, hey, well, what's it actually like to do this? I don't want someone to sugarcoat it. Like, give it to me straight. Uh, so that, that's what I'm here to do, you know, for you today. So, because I want, want everyone, if this is something that you're interested in, to be well informed going into this. So you can make ultimately the decision if maybe this is actually something that you even do want to attempt and take on. So just so I kind of have a barometer here, is there anybody that is currently farrowing? Oh, wonderful. Okay. How many of you want to? Okay. All right. Sweet. Okay, so the first thing that we kind of need to identify is like, what is profitable? What does profitable mean to you? Profitable means different things to different people. Honestly, it first kind of hinges on what your goal is. I got that first guilt uh, because I was so sick of the struggle every spring to find quality feeders in my area getting kind of the runaround from the people that had the piglets available. Oh, I have some, oh wait, no, I don't have some. Oh yeah, I do, but you need to pick them up like today. And it was very stressful and it was very inconsistent. And so finally I was like, well, I kind of see a need to do this for myself. So my goal starting out was I want one sow that I can breed via AI so I don't have to keep a boar. And I'm going to have two litters of piglets a year it's going to provide me with my feeders that I want to raise for my own consumption, and then the rest of them I can sell to other people. The sale of those, this is all in my, this was my goal, uh, the sale of those piglets is going to offset the cost of keeping the sow year round, and it's going to also pay for as much of or all of the feed to raise those uh, ones that I kept back for myself to grow out. And it'd be really nice if it would also pay for some of, if not all of the butchering costs. Because again, when I was first starting out, I was also you know, taking them to a processor. That was my whole goal. So the goal has been a moving target for me over the years. It's changed a bit. As like I said, I've had more of a demand, more of a need. I've scaled up a little bit. Um, but it, it means different things to different people. It might, for you, it might be like, I just love pigs. And if I break even and I make $1, it's going to warrant the fact that like I can keep them because they are not costing me money. Um, some people, it might be, like I just said, break even, cover costs of feed, butchering, essentially, aside from the labor aspect, you're getting free meat, Keep uh, uh, covering the cost of the sow and getting the meat out of it as well. And then, of course, even more than that, all those same things, but maybe I have a little bit of money extra on the side and I can buy that, you know, new roll of fence uh, for that fencing project or I can get this really nice new watering system or whatever those you know things may be and then there's kind of like the uh, the pipe dream as I call it below that red line which is I'm just gonna farrow pigs and I'm, I'm gonna retire because I can live on that entirely so I, I call that the uh, the pipe dream fantasy so generally speaking there are of course like some very basic upfront general costs associated with any animal, any livestock that you keep. Um, but as far as pigs go specifically, of course you need to invest in breeding stock. So depending on where you live, which is, th it's things like this that I have a really hard time putting a number on because it's so variable. Depending on geographic location, depending on the breed, depending on the cross, whatever it may be. Um, but you do regard, you know, whatever you end up doing, you have to invest in breeding stock initially. And that could cost you between, oh, for the record, I didn't say this, but I am definitely going to be talking numbers and running you through some like scenarios so you have an idea of mu how much this could actually cost you up front before you even get like your first litter. But I'm not going to bore you with spreadsheets, don't worry. Um, so for example, where I live, uh, Gloucestershire old spots are, you know, all the rage right now. People love them. They're super hot and trendy. A registered guilt from a, you know, a farm that is GOSA is $500 for a guilt. Okay? So that's a, we're going to say a 
six month or six week to eight week old, you know, weaned gilt. So registered breeding stock, she's going to cost you about $500. That number might fluctuate depending on where you live, but that's just an idea. Um, my mutts, for instance, I, I raise mutts, I raise crossbreeds, and I do sell breeding stock because that's also one of the things that I've really, I, like I said, it's a passion project. I've really gotten into the genetic, the genetics and the selection for maternal traits and maternal lines. And I, full disclosure, my mutts, I sell them for breeding quality gilts I sell them for $350 some people have encouraged me they're like you need to be charging more than that <laughs> some people of course think that's too much but I I'm happy with that number so that just you know gives you somewhat of a range though that you could be looking at um, some people will just go and buy a feeder and they're like hey I got a gilt I'm you know I'm gonna keep her and I'm gonna breed her that might be $150 you know whatever it might be but those are some you know very realistic numbers if you're going to be getting a boar versus AI also, you know, there are costs associated with that. We're going to get into that. Um, and then you have your feed and bedding. So feed is going to be your number one expense with pigs. Um, that's just the way it is. Know that now going into it and accept that fate. We, there are ways to help cut costs and offset costs, but that is absolutely going to be your number one cost. Bedding, variable options, but you know, whether you use straw, whether you use hay, whether you use chopped uh, corn stalks, um, wood, sh or, yeah, wood shavings, whatever it may be, whatever is available to you, whether, whatever is in your area that's affordable, again, but th that is a cost associated with it. I am, like I said, in New England, so right now my sows are in the woods and they have no bedding. Uh, but because they're barrowed under trees or, you know, doing whatever they're doing, living their best life at the moment. But... October through March, oh, April for sure. Uh, yeah, they have bedding because we are ve we very much get winter. And so I move them into their wintering area that we have for them that's, you know, closer to the house, closer to the water source, all those things. Uh, you are also going to have structure. Is there anybody here that is like starting pretty much from scratch, ground up, you don't have any infrastructure starting out. Okay, you are my people. So, same, same. I had to buy, like you, every nail, fence post, clip, zip tie, panel, whatever it may be. I did not have, there was not one scrap of fencing. There was not an outbuilding. All there was was like a garden shed, which is not suited for livestock. So, all of that stuff we had to put into place. So that is a cost that's going. Should I just keep talking? Okay. Uh, that I'm IT challenged, but that was not on me. Uh, so there are costs associated with that. You need to take that into consideration. Again, if, if you're just starting out. Um, all right, perfect. Electric bill. This is one that I feel like some people don't take into consideration. Like I said, I live in the north. We get winter. Everything freezes, freezes solid. Those submersible uh, heaters, guess what? That's, that doesn't run for free, that uses electricity. Um, if you farrow in the winter and if you utilize, choose to utilize heat mats, heat lamps, guess what? Your meter starts spinning that's going to be adding to your electric bill, so you need to take those costs into consideration as well. Veterinary care, it happens. Accidents happen, animals get sick, animals trip, fall, have injuries, whatever it may be. I actually know people as well that utilize their vets for castration. I don't, I castrate my own piglets, but I actually have a friend in Ohio, she, and this is, there is a genetic um, aspect to this, but she frequently gets hernias in her piglets. And so just as a precaution for her so that she doesn't accidentally basically gut the animal while trying to ca castrate, she has her vet castrate all of her males, which runs her about 10 to $15 per piglet. So again, 
that's an added cost if that is something that you end up do needing to do. Um, and then, of course, the one that I feel like everyone, including myself, uh, does not take into consideration and forgets about is your time and labor. So some of us, well, some of us, and I say me, me I'm sure there are other people out there, I, I just love, truly love what I do so much that even if I barely made any money, uh, I would still do it for the love of it. So I have a really hard time uh, factoring in my labor and, and, and my uh, well, time and labor uh, beca because of that. But it is a very real thing. If you have to put up, create this building and you're going to be out there for three months building the structure after work at night like me and my husband have done, that's taking away from other projects or that's taking away from other things that you might want to be doing or other obligations. So but you so you do need to ultimately take that into consideration. If you maybe don't have the greatest setup at first and you're lugging buckets of water all over the place, again, that's that's a lot of, a lot of time and labor that you do need to take into consideration. Cuz it's like, well, if I'm profiting $100, but I'm lugging buckets of water for 10 hours a week or, you know, whatever it might be, it's like, oh, okay, maybe that's maybe that's not so so worth it. So just all these are all just food for food for thought, things to kind of be mindful of and take into consideration. So we're going to run through a little scenario here. So we are going to pretend everybody got a guilt. So you got a guilt that was weaned at six weeks old. Okay, so sh she's six weeks old. You just picked her up from the breeder. And we are going to just run through with some numbers. What is it going to cost you to feed her? Because again, this is your number one expense. What is it going to cost you to feed her to get her to the age of breeding, to get her through gestation to, let's say, the day she farrows, assuming that she farrows on the dot at, a, at day 114 of gestation? And then what could you be potentially looking at for costs to feed her through lactation? So again, we have a six-week-old wean gilt. Feed prices, which if anybody here is currently feeding livestock, you know that prices are getting, have gotten absolutely out of control. And people are doing everything that they can to try to re reduce those costs. Um, and of course, just prices have gone up. I had to raise the cost of my, my feeder piglets as well because it, quite frankly, just costs so much more money to feed the sows. So we are going to use a price point range of 28 cents to 50 cents per pound. So for context, if you go to your co-op, your feed store, whatever it may be, uh, you have, you see a feed bag, 50 pound feed bag that's sitting on the shelf that is $20.99 a pound, which is a very average price, I would say, for quality feed. That's 42 cents a pound, okay? Purina pig and sow, for instance, which is one that all the, like, the tractor supplies carry, last, and, and I don't know about in other areas of the country, I know it's gone up even more, but last time I was at tractor supply, I just kind of like checked on the shelf, that has gone up, that is $25 for a 50 pound bag, so that, that's 50 cents a pound. So I'm going to go ultra conservative on all of these numbers, just for the sake of not terrifying everybody. Uh, but just know, depending on where you live and what feed costs where you live, it may be more, it also may be less. So we're going to just split the baby here, and that is an average of 39 cents per pound. So that's what your, your average cost is going to be for your feed. Now, oh, Piglet, she's weaned, six weeks old. <sighs> depending on how much she weighs, I mean, she's certainly not going to be eating four pounds a day right off the bat. Um, it'll be less. And then as she gets through later in gestation, she might be eating more. Uh, if you're going to bump her um, leading up to farrowing, also need to take into consideration breed and individual genetics. Some just simply grow better than others, uh, whether it be dictated by their breed or whether it be the individual genetics uh, of, of the particular sow or the boar um, at the farm that you got her from. 
So, uh, but just for a nice average number, um, I feel comfortable with this number, we're gonna just say four, four pounds a day is going to be her average consumption. So at that, four pounds a day, at 39 cents a pound, it's costing you $1.56 a day to feed her, okay? Doesn't sound like too terribly much. You're like, oh, $1.56, okay, well, guess what? It adds up. So we're gonna say an average age of breeding is gonna be 255 days. So that's eight and a half months, most, including myself, for, for most of your typical crosses. You're gonna shoot to have them pharaoh like at their first, right around their first birthday. So if you're breeding them at eight and a half months, that's putting you right around that, that point. So 255 days. Now, you bought her at six weeks old. You didn't feed her for those first 42 days. So 255 days minus the 42 days that she, she was that old when you got her. You've been feeding her from weaning to the day of breeding for 213 days. So at $1.56 a day, that's $332 that you've paid just in food, just in food, from weaning to the day of breeding. But then gestation, so let's say, hey, great, she settled on her, on her first, uh, your first attempt at breeding. So she settled, gestation is 114 days on average. Again, in this hypothetical situation, she's gonna pharaoh at 114 days on the nose. So that's, again, an additional $178 to get her through gestation. So, I mean, where, where are we at at this point? We are at $510 roughly, if I, oh, what do you know, I deleted it. I think it's like $510. Um, $510 to get her from weaning to the day of farrowing. This is not factoring in any other cost. This is not bedding. This is not possibly supplementation. This is not any infrastructure that you had to put in place. This is nothing else. This is strictly feed. So the, you know, the million dollar question is, well, how much does a sow in, or in lactation eat? A lot. <laughs> <laughs> is very dependent on many things, one of which is, of course, the size of the particular sow. Um, how milky is she? My sows look like milk cows. They are walking milk bars. Very, very milky, which, guess what? That makes really fat, awesome, healthy piglets. But you don't get that way by being starved, you know? It takes calories fat, protein, all those things to make milk. So depending on her individual genetics, depending on litter size is also a big one. The more piglets she has, the more a demand she's gonna have on her udder, the more it's going to put a toll on her and put pressure on her to produce more milk so she needs more food. I have a sow, um, Jenny. If anybody follows me on Instagram, um, my one sow, Jenny, uh, she is my best sow as far as performance goes. So I was actually looking through my notes last night because I was like, oh, I need to get some numbers in my head. Um, so she is hopefully, which, sh sh knock on wood, she has never not settled. Uh, very, f she's a fertile myrtle. So uh, she ha is hopefully pregnant right now with her sixth litter. She has had a total of 70 piglets out of, out of five litters. Um, and so she is prolific. She makes a lot of babies and she makes a lot of milk. This past spring, she had 17 piglets, all of which were alive. There's not enough there's not enough teats to feed the, those many babies. Thankfully, her sister farrowed at the exact same time. They were both in labor together. Stole babies off of Jenny, put them on Claire, because Claire had some vacancy. Um, but that, again, incredible amount of pressure on her body to produce. The very, very general rule of thumb that is a starting point and is very much a moving target is your sow's maintenance ration plus one pound a day per piglet.
Again, that's the starting point. As she makes her way through lactation, piglets get bigger. Piglets uh, actually evacuate more milk out as they're suckling. That triggers her body to produce more milk. And then guess what? They turn into little snots and they want their cake and they want to eat it too. So not only do they crowd the milk bar, but then mama goes to eat and guess who's trying to shove mom out of her food dish because they're starting to eat food too. So just because that's the general rule of thumb, again, like I said, a starting point, but that absolutely goes up through lactation until the point of weaning. weaning. For super, super conservative numbers, it's absolutely more than this. But again, this is just for this scenario. Jenny very conservatively consumed 20 pounds a day of grain at $1.56, again, remember in this uh, situation, a day. So that's $330 to feed her for a six week period. It was more, I'm telling you it was more, but I'm being conservative here. So $330 for lactation, plus that $510 that you already fed her to get from weaning to breeding, you're at $840. Well, how much did you pay for her initially too? Is she a purebred Gloucestershire old spot and you paid 500 bucks for her? Is she a mutt like mine that you paid $350 for her? So you are easily, even a conservative number, you paid like feeder piglet price for her, you are $1,000 into that sow, or into that guilt to get that first litter of piglets. So it is not, it is not cheap to feed them. And, get, and that doesn't even take into consideration breeding because, of course, she had to, you know, get pregnant to have this litter of piglets. So you can go one of two ways, of course, with breeding. You can go the AI route and you can go the live cover or the boar route. So I am very much pro AI on Homestead because for most of us, we don't have all of the space in the world to house animals that maybe only have one specific pur purpose one to you know two times a year whatever it may be and it just doesn't financially make sense for us to maintain them however i also do see the place with for instance if you are in that um if your goal and your intention of farrowing is for instance for like uh conserving heritage breeds, if you're like, I love large blacks, I love Gloucestershire Old Spot, or I wanna help you know, maintain the breed, you need, you're gonna need to buy a boar. Um, because I have tried for m years at this point and still cannot get my hands on Gloucestershire Old Spot. What was it, the tent? Tent moved? Uh, can't get my hands on Gloucestershire Old Spot uh, semen for AI. So if I had a GOS guilt and I had no boar to AI her to, then I have a very expensive guilt that all I'm going to get are mutts that are, you know, not saving the breed and I'm not going to be able to get as much money to recoup my costs. So you also need to take that into consideration. As far as AI goes, I mean, you can spend anywhere from 25 to $150 a dose if you wanted to. If you're strictly breeding for meat quality, totally go with like the meat quality, cheaper $25 special, pick your breed. I personally love Shipley Swine Genetics. They're in Ohio. Um, they are constantly running specials or they just have like, you pick the breed. I really want a Berkshire Cross, but you're not particular in what boar you get. And they'll just pretty much send you what they probably have in excess of that day. I've gotten some really expensive boars doing that. I'm like, whoa, this dude was like $150 a dose and I got it for $25. Um, so if you're just after meat quality, spend that $25 per dose. So conservatively, you can figure the, oh, sorry, rods, lubes, et cetera. A five pack of rods is $4. Lube, general all-purpose lube at Tractor Supply, $7, $8, something like that. Uh, the biggie with, of course, AI is going to be your shipping. 
And like feed costs, shipping has gotten out of control over the last few years. I used to pay, it was like 50, I looked at an uh, invoice before I left. I used to pay like $55 for overnight shipping from Ohio to Massachusetts, which side note, um, my day job is in manufacturing and sometimes someone's like, can you overnight me a motor? And I'm like, it's like $700, are you sure? Um, so it, that's quite cheap in the grand scheme of things. Um, but just within the past you know, couple years, it has crept up. My most recent um, shipment, it was $70, $70. So it went up like 15 bucks. So again, that's an, it's an increase in cost. It's not that terrible, but it's still an increase in cost to take into consideration. So. If you're going to breed her AI, it's a three, uh, three doses for a breeding is a very, again, that's a very solid number to, to plan on. That's $75 in semen, plus let's say you have your overnight shipping, now you're at 145 and then we're just gonna round up because you got some rods and some lube and maybe you got some hog meat, boar scent, and all that good stuff. So you're gonna be at $165 for a breeding. That, that one breeding for her. Now, if you farrow twice a year, which I'm going to talk about later, um, that's an annual cost of $330 for, of breeding costs for two litters a year. Because guess what? You don't have to take care of that boar. You just have to buy you know, his supply that someone else is paying the cost to, make, to keep him. If you do want to go the live cover route, Again, cost can't really put a number on it because it all depends on the breed, your location, all that good stuff. But let's just say between 150 to $500 could be a potential upfront cost in the purchase of a boarling or a boar. Now he has to eat too, and he has, you know, he has a maintenance ration associated with him. The difference with him is that in this situation because you know like oh did you buy an older one did you buy a younger one we look at him kind of like as far as his like annual cost to keep year round because I'm doing an, kind of like an annual analysis here but as he grows he's going to get bigger he's going to eat more too so an a very conservative good number to use maintenance ration of five pounds of food a day to keep that boar at a dollar or I'm sorry at that dollar 56 a day that we used for the guilt as well that is seven hundred dollars annually that is just to feed him that does not take into into any consideration additional infrastructure possibly a different additional shelter, which is infrastructure, I guess, uh, separate waters, because of course, a lot of people, you want to control your breeding. If it's like, well, geez, I, I'm going to wean her now. If I put him right together, he's going to breed her on that first cycle. Like, I don't want to be farrowing in end of July in Tennessee when it's a hundred and whatever it gets down here. Uh, um, so you would need to keep them separate so that they don't breed so you can control that timing. So he's going to need a bachelor pad. So, but there's costs associated with that as well. Again, because most of us um, are starting from the ground up as far as that goes. And if you aren't, you already have, you know, infrastructure in place, then like that's that's fantastic. And again, like there are additional costs with boars. They're not immune to getting sick. They're not immune to getting injured. I know a few people that have had their boars, they lost their boars because they they broke a there are children around. So they broke a very important organ doing a certain task that they have to do. So, it, it, it happens. Um, uh, someone that I had originally bought a guilt from a long time ago, when I went up there, I was like, oh yeah, like I AI and blah, blah, blah. And she's like, oh, well, I would never do that. She's like, we got, we got our boar. And he was a good looking boar. Two months later, she was emailing me, oh my gosh, my boar broke his penis. He can't breed. I need to AI because I need to stay on schedule. Can you please help me? I'm like, oh, well, how about that? <laughs> um, so things to take into consideration, though. Um, so they are certainly not immune to anything happening. All right, so now we're going to get to, I told you about how everything is so expensive. <laughs> Now we're going to talk a bit about on how to cut some of those costs. So again, 
starting out is expensive. When you're starting out in general with homesteading and you're buying everything up front, you make mistakes, some of which can be very expensive, unfortunately. I have made many a mistake, and it's just kind of the way that it does happen. It is going to take you time to pay yourself back to make what you're doing profitable, or you might be like, well, this is just not working for, uh, for us. Maybe this just is not our cup of tea, and that's okay too. Um, but but just know, like, you're not going to see a profit overnight, even especially with livestock in this scenario, right? You bought that gilt. Well, you're not even going to see a litter of piglets for a year. It is an investment, time, money, etc. And so a lot of margins are often very, very tight, even when you are getting into the profitable point. You're, you're finally like, all right, I'm seeing some profit here. I've paid myself back and like things are really doing well. Sometimes you are just one epic disaster away from like, well, we're just going to call that a loss and uh, just hope that things go better next time. Because it happens. Every, it's that seasons of life, right? Ebbs and flows. You have good times. You have bad times. You have successes. You have failures. The hope is, is the end of the day, it all washes out and it, it works out in the end. And it's like, all right, we're, it all worked out in the end, even if it, we had some high points and low points. So my number one advice, uh, I am going to 100% trip on this at some point. So my number one advice would be to do not skimp on nutrition. So as I said, feed is going to be your number one cost associated. So people's knee-jerk reaction is, well, I'm just going to buy cheaper feed. Okay, so there is a reason why some feed is expensive. Well, some of it is just like, you have no right charging this, this amount of money for this. But the, for instance, the feed that I feed my sows, it is a very great feed that is targeted for breeding stock. Sows or breeders are not feeders. They have different nutritional needs. And I'm going to do everything I can to not go down a tangent here because I know like I have some people on my Patreon here and this is why I always like go down this rabbit hole. Um, so... If you skim them on nutrition, you're gonna see like a short-term benefit. You're like, oh yeah, man, I just saved like 20 bucks this week or, or whatever it may be. What are the long-term effects? Likely she is not getting what she needs from a nutritional, nutritional standpoint. So, okay, well, she might have delayed puberty. She might have an estrus altogether. She might have weak heats, lower fertility. She might not be getting what she needs in her development stage to set her up for a long life of production because there's nothing more profitable than a sow that is in the herd as long as possible because it's that first lead up year that's like all the investment is, not all the investment, but that's a lot of investment there. So if you cheat her during that time, it is likely going to hurt you and her later on down the road. So there are ways to cut costs on feed without depriving her of what she needs. So again, this is just my little, my little blurb that I have to say. Please, please, please don't skimp on nutrition. So not all feed, yeah, yeah, I said that already. Okay, so how can you save on the feed, all right? I actually just went through this. So I have feed, uh, changed my feed last fall. I changed completely different brand, different mill, all that good stuff. And I was buying it by the pallet, but it was in 50, 50 pound bags on a pallet. Um, and it, I got a pallet rate and I was like, oh, hey, I'm doing like, okay here. Cause I was doing that with the previous feed as well. And for context, the, the feed that I feed is a 17% protein. And if anybody has access to it, it's called, it's Blue Seal Sow Performance. Um, it is amazing quality for breeding stock. So a 50 pound bag to just go and buy that off the shelf. If I walk into the feed store, it's sitting there on the shelf. It is, tw whoa buddy, it is $20.99 for a 50 pound bag. That is 42 cents a pound, which we went over that like the you know first slide before. Now, if I buy that by the pallet, so a pallet is a ton and that's 40 50 pound bags. 
It is $799. These are my prices. I called the mill the day before I left. Uh, it is $799.60. So that's for a ton. So that equates to $19.99 per 50 pound bag. So you just saved a dollar a bag. So you saved 40 pounds oh, like by buying a ton up front as opposed to buying it by the bag. And that brought the cost down to 39 cents a pound. So three cents per pound savings, which like, okay, it's something I'm all about like picking away, hey, if I can save a buck here, buck here, like it all, it all adds up for sure. But it's like, yeah, I think we can do better. So if you go the tote route, a one ton tote, those are those monster bags that you see people like unloading with a tractor. And if you're like, oh, I don't have a tractor, we'll get there. So if you unload that uh, off a tractor, the big white bags that usually has like, it has a tie at the bottom that you pull, people will pull like, uh, dump into those like big Osborne feeders that you see. So that is a one ton bag, so 2,000 pounds. I just bought a ton a month and a half ago and it cost me $601. So that dropped the price if you look at it at a 50, because a lot, every, everybody, and I do this too, even though I, you know, been looking at things by the per pound and stuff. Um, it's easy to think of things in terms of 50 pound bags. So that's kind of why I'm breaking it down. So that $601 for that ton, that is $15 a bag. So that is a $5 a bag savings over the pallet rate, and it's a $6 a bag savings over just going and buying it off of the shelf. That brings it down to 30 cents a pound, which is nine cents less than the average that we used in our, you know, our previous hypothetical situation here. That is a monster, that is monster savings. So that is a savings of 36 cents a day. So rather than going from $1.56 a per day to feed at a $4 uh, maintenance ration, that drops you down to $1.20. Over the course of that 327 days that we had used in that, that previous scenario, um, that's $118 in savings to get them from breeding through gestation. Now, if you're feeding 20 pounds a day because you have a Jenny on your hands and you're also saving um, that, uh, wait, where is it? Yeah, that, that nine cents a pound, again, that adds up. It really, really adds up. So what if you don't have a tractor? because a lot of people don't. It took us like four years when we did everything. Oh my gosh, it was so hard and difficult and everything was like, well, if we just had a tractor, we could do this in five minutes rather than five hours. Like it makes everything so much slower. I would strongly recommend, or not strongly recommend, this is my next one. Um, so I have a, a friend who has no tractor. She has a basically like a hillside as well as a driveway and she buys feed for her she raises um feeder she doesn't she doesn't breed her farrow um but she buys pigs from a local farm grows them out and sells them she you know sells them to some customers that she has but she totally appreciates that uh buying in bulk is a much bigger savings for her than buying it by the bag. But again, she has no tractor and she has a pretty difficult driveway. So this is where sweat equity, wait, oh, I'm here. Okay, whew, I was scared for a second. Um, this is where sweat equity really comes into play. They drop that feed bag off at her driveway and basically her and her husband and her children, whatever capabilities they have, cause they're young, they lug it up by the five gallon bucket load into their bin that they keep in their barn. So this is probably one of those situations that like you might want to take into consideration that whole time and labor thing. But I'm really, I'm really glad that we had this conversation before my talk. I was in the speaker tent earlier um, uh, talking to Daniel Salatin, uh, me and him and my friend Ann. And he was talking about like some of these just jobs that are just so daunting. It's like, this is going to be absolutely miserable. Um, how are we going to get through this kind of a thing? He's like, invite friends over and be like, this is what we're going to do. We're going to have dinner at six. 
but you come over at four and we're going to lug buckets of feed and then I'm going to feed you <laughs> as a reward for it. So reach out, get your friends, get, you know, family involved, be like, hey, anybody want a free workout? We're doing farmer's carries up the driveway, you know, whatever, whatever it may be. Um, but absolutely something that if you can find a way to make it work and you're not like, this is the worst thing ever, I would rather spend the additional money. Um, there, there are ways to try to make it a little bit more enjoyable and really feel worth it to you. Now, the big thing you need to take into consideration, too, is what if it's too much feed? What if you only have one gilt? You're like, man, I really want that savings, but feed does not keep forever, especially down here in this sweltering humidity. It's going to spoil. So if you're not going to be going through that in a reasonable amount of time, it's going to spoil, and that is a very bad situation because then you have you're out that feed and who cares that you saved cost because you're you're throwing out you know who knows how much so in those situations oh I'm gonna totally get to questions later um so in those I'm afraid if you ask questions I'm gonna squirrel and just start like ping-ponging off this tent and go all kinds of directions um I I have a uh, not the greatest fan of Facebook groups for many reasons, but some of the community groups are really great. Uh, like if you live in a certain geographical area, so like I'm in a couple that it's like Western Mass Livestock or um, you know New England Farm and, and Homesteading. There are people on there that are starting, that are likely in the same situation as you. Post an ad and be like, hey, who wants to go in on a bulk feed order? We could save this much money. I approximate that I need about this many pounds. So that leaves me with, you know, X amount of pounds that is available. Like, who wants to get in on this and let's all save some money? So utilize, um, like, situations such as that. Because, again, the, the uh, savings are really worth it. Or if you maybe have just friends that you know that you all raise them together or about the same time. It's like, hey, let's just all go in on a feed order together and let's all, again, all save some money. So, I love how I grabbed this and I didn't take a drink. Uh, hold on. So, bedding, that was uh, one of our general costs as well. Like I said, in the summer, my sows, I don't, I don't give them bedding. They live out, they're outside um, in the woods currently. And in the winter, though, I absolutely need to use bedding of sorts. I personally keep my sows in, in the winter in a shelter logic. It's a 12 by 12 shelter logic, um, like one of the horse ones, like the corral ones, but I actually sided it with metal roofing. Um, so that's where they spend their winter. I do very, very deep layer of wood chips that I get for free from the town um, because everyone's like, oh, chip drop is great. Well, guess what? I tried chip drop for three years and I never got a single drop. So thankfully, the guy that's in charge of the town roads lives up the street from me and they're always trimming trees and arborists drop them off and he's always like, oh, hey, you need some wood chips. So I do a deep layer of wood chips and then I, I personally, because straw is so expensive where I live, because straw is a very select seasonal cover crop and not that many people really do it. Um, this is probably, some people are gonna probably drop their jaws, jaws here. Uh, straw where I live goes for $13 a square bale. Yeah, brutal, yes, it's awful. And like I'm from PA, Northwest PA, and like back home it's like I still, like my dad's like, oh yeah, it's like five bucks. And I was like, dear Lord. Um, so yeah, $13. So let's just say I am not willy nilly giving my pigs straw at $13 a bale in the winter because it is such an expensive thing and it is it, just not worth it to me and in an effort to, to cut costs, the hay that my cow drops out of the hay feeder that gets on the ground, I rake that up and you know pitch it into my sows and they make a bedding out of that on top of their wood chips. The great thing is that because my girls are very big and they snuggle and they generate a lot of heat, uh, those wood chips break down over the winter and they start to compost and they also help generate heat for them as well. And that top 
top layer really does turn into not uh, not like a wood chip material, but more of like a compost material. And just by you know consistently adding some like you know spent hay to it, or um, I in the past too have uh, seen like random ads on marketplace where. Uh, like sawmills, someone's like, oh, hey, like, I got all these chips, like, come fill up your truck. I'm like, be there as soon as I can, you know? So throw those in for them as well. Just make sure you're not using anything that's, like, potentially toxic um, as far as, like, trees go or no, nothing that's, like, pressure treated. I don't know anybody that does that, but I also am not a woodworker. So if that exists, stay away from that. So because straw is so expensive, I only use it in farrowing in the winter. Because again, I do farrow in the winter. I farrow in February. Um, two days after my two of my sows had their litters, our real temperatures, not like the real feel, but the actual temperature was negative eight degrees. And so I was giving those girls some serious straw for them and for their piglets because straw is a very great bedding for insulation purposes helps it really does help keep them warm better than anything else that I could possibly uh, give them um, also in the Midwest I know a big thing that people do are bales of corn stalks and corn husks that's a thing I don't know if anybody knows or, like has that in their area be cautious with my I'm not saying it's not a good option but they, those things are notorious for having mycotoxins um, because of, you know, they might harvest the corn and it's just like it gets wet. Uh, it's not their prime crop, so they're not prioritizing. They're, they're prioritizing the corn, not, not the stalks and the, and the cobs or the husks or whatever. Um, so not the husks, not the cobs. Uh, so it might get wet and that it's just like an open invitation for mycotoxins, which could be absolutely detrimental. So if you are going to use those, I it just me, this is just me being in, in an abundance of caution, um, unless they were really cheap and it was like, I could actually save some like serious money, I would probably buy a few and I would send samples out for testing just to make sure. Because if anybody here doesn't know what mycotoxins are, basically it's uh, fungal spores that can get into the grain, into like whatever it is that you're harvesting. And it absolutely wreaks havoc on livestock. Um, depending on the particular mycotoxin, it can be reproductive, uh, it can be growth related. There's, there's all kinds of problems, but it is a very big problem, especially when you're seeing some of these areas of the country that are just, which some of people are, it's like, you know, we're in a drought, it's so dry, where others, it's like, it's done nothing but rain. And so guess what? That's, that moisture is just, that's just asking for it. So if you're going to do that, just please, I just, again, want you to be informed going into this. So another thing that I, I personally love, like I've, already how many times have I referenced marketplace um, try to get everything to like as much as you can second hand you can save so much money um, whether it be feeders whether it be barrels that you're going to use for like a nipple water um, we <laughs> porta huts uh, I so when we were building our chicken coop, which it was a chicken coop originally, which then quickly became a farrowing house and then has been, it has evolved. It's gone through some iterations over the years. Um, we were going to go roof, we needed to roof this thing. And I'm like, oh man, like things are so expensive. You know, it's just when you're starting out, everything is so expensive. Buying, like I said, every little nail, every little post. She's like, how can I save money somewhere? So I went to the hardware store because I had to get, you know, probably for the 15th time had to get a box of screws or whatever it may be and I'm looking around and underneath an overhang there were so many busted bags of shingles like various colors the bags were ripped open it looked kind of like maybe a mini tornado blew through because they were just kind of a mess and so I saw it as I'm walking by and I go in and I get what I need and I ask them I'm like hey I was like so those shingles out there uh they're all busted and they're not in bags like you know could I get those at a discount because hey 
homegirl needed some roofing material, you know? And he's like, oh, he's like, we can't sell those. He's like, they're, you know, missing out of the bags or they're, they're you know, some of them are ripped or whatever. Um, he's like, you just take what you want and you can have them as long as it's not a new bag. So I had a multi-colored roof and I did not care because it was free and it just so happened that where we built the shelter, it was the roof was orienting in a way that I literally never even had to see it. So, cause it's, it's one of those like slant style roofs. So I was like, hey, I don't have to look at it. I really don't care that it's ugly as sin. It was free and it's gonna get the job done. So just little things like that. Metal roofing off of Marketplace or Craigslist. People all the time over buy and then they either are too lazy to try to return it or they can't and they also don't have any other projects that they know they want for it and so they're just like, no, I'll just sell it and get some of my money back. Scoop those up. You know, even if it's a multicolored roof, uh, rough cut lumber, everything that we have built for our livestock is built out of rough cut lumber. Nothing is like nice and kiln dried, um, you know, from the hardware store or a lumber yard. So uh, probably my greatest purchase ever. This is like the score that my husband and I still laugh about today because I actually used one of these panels last week and he's like, these things are the gift that keeps on giving. So we, when we were starting out, then we're like, we need fencing and we need fencing panels, but oh my God, fencing is so expensive. And so we're looking around Craigslist because at that point, I don't even know if Marketplace was around then. And so we're looking and someone had a post and it was like a photo. It looked like it was taken from like 15 miles away of a, stack of all you could see was well it's metal and it kind of looks like fencing so just like this stack of panels and it's like metal panels and it's like one hundred dollars it was like one hundred dollars like come and get them or something like that and so we reach out we go we get them and first of all the stack i'm not kidding was like this high it was huge there were so many panels and we look at it, and we're like, this is not fencing. This is like those cement great panels that they use when they put down and they like cement, like put in sidewalks and stuff. But we're looking at them like, this will work. This will work. We can make this work. And those cement, those panels were the fence for my gilt's farrowing area for the first several years. We find we took them down, we now have like actual real fencing, but again, I am constantly stealing those panels to like I need to block something off. Uh we've built like you know cut cut uh, pieces out of them to make like a hay, a hay feeder for my lambing jug. So like the, the ewes can stick their head in and they can eat. Um, Cause we're like, it was a hundred dollars for like a million of them. So like if we have to cut them up a little bit, like at this, at this point they have more than paid for themselves. But again, it wasn't fencing, but it got, it wasn't a true fencing, but it did get the job done. So don't be afraid to get creative. Don't be afraid to make things a little bit ugly as long as it works. And down the road, once you, you know, get a bit more profitable, you can totally replace things and, you know, make it better. Planning ahead is a really big thing too. And it's such a balance because you don't want to buy everything under the sun in anticipation of a disaster because expiration dates some of them are more more suggestions uh some are like okay i actually probably should pay attention to this um but again you don't want to be going and buying a ton of things and never have to use them or by the time you need them because you bought it six years ago it's expired and it's no good so th there's definitely a balance to be said for that but there is nothing more expensive in the in the long run than a last minute scramble having to run and um, like pick up something from your vet that's an hour and a half away, that's a three hour round trip because you're in an emergency situation or having to overnight ship something because tractor supply doesn't carry it or your co-op doesn't carry it or whatever it may be. So there's definitely a balance to be struck here and it is totally dependent on what's accessible in your area and what what there is readily for you. Um, you know, I notoriously live in an area that is just, it is not, 
just people don't think of the Northeast and think of pigs, you know? It's just, not, it's hard to even find a vet that will even look at a pig. But, so knowing that, knowing that I can't go to the store and get something that I might actually need because it's on the shelf, I do know that for my own personal sanity um, and to prevent that last minute scramble that could end up being potentially very expensive, you know, I am planned ahead and I, I'm well stocked in advance. So that's just, again, something to, to keep in the back of your mind. All right, so this is going to be some, this is my like reality check here because we've talked about the costs, we've talked about like ways to cut costs, things that you can do. And I will be the first person to say like, I, I love pigs, I love fairing. It's like, I am quite possibly not right in the head for feeling that way. Um, because bad stuff happens. It really happens. It happens with any livestock, but pigs have a, you know, they have a, they have a reputation, you know, for just like some really devastating things happening. Um, there is a reason why there are, uh, like I provide piglets to local farms because they're like, I'm not, I'm not fair away. Mm -mm, no way. You know, they're not going to maintain that breeding stock year round and they're not going to feed that sow and put all that money into it only to have an absolute bomber of a litter or a disaster on their hands. And then guess what? They have meat customers, then they have to turn around and then they have to scramble and go buy feeders from someone else who farrows and then they're out even more money because of the money that they lost on the litter and then the money that they're out to go and purchase more piglets. So you can do everything right. You can get the best genetics, you can be the best at feeding, you can be the best at nutrition and supplementation and it still hits the fan. So tiny litters, devastating crushings, predator attacks, sick pigs, dead pigs. It, it is very sad how many people I know that have had their guilts die during labor. So imagine you're at that over a thousand dollar mark. You bought her, you fed her, you bred her, this highly anticipated litter that you are over a thousand dollars into and she dies and you have absolutely nothing to show for it. So I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just trying to give you like the very, you know, again, the, the reality of the situation. And I personally um, would don't, so because these things happen, you just don't know when that they could happen, it might never happen, or you might just have like a really bad season. So don't go counting your piglets before they hatch. 100%, I'm, I'm all for generating interest and being like, hey, uh, you know, my gill or my sow's bread, like I might be having some piglets available or be having some piglets available at this rough time frame. If you're interested in getting on my wait list, like, you know, here, sign up. Do not go banking on that and don't be, and I'm such a, I'm not like necessarily a superstitious person, but even though I've been doing this for years at this point and I have some very like solid seasoned sows, I don't even reach out to the people that are on my wait list until the piglets are like two, two and a half weeks old. Cause I'm just, I, I've seen like really weird things happen and I just don't want to go promising people something, making them think that I have a product for them, and then I don't. Because when it comes to the livestock world, if you're gonna be getting into selling animals, whether it be for breeding stock or for eating stock, seriously, reputation is everything. Word of mouth. People have heard about, you know, the, the, some of the farms that have been referred to me are because of other people that buy piglets from me. That's how they found out about me. That's how they got to be my customer. And so, I don't want to be getting the reputation for the person that promises and then can't deliver. So just, just be very, again, very, very, very mindful of that. And I do have a good story here. So what time is it? Oh man, I'm actually doing really well. All right. So my first guilt, and if anybody here follows me uh, on Instagram, I am talking about uh, all of fame, Big Marie. So I bought this guilt 
oh man, I was so stupid. With stars in my eyes, I had no idea what I was doing, what I was looking at, and I was like, you know, I'm gonna AI myself, I'm gonna do this, that, and the other thing. I did, I bred her in October. She bred, or she settled on her first breeding. My first time AI, I was like so excited. I was like, yeah, I did this. So I'm like anticipating that first litter. It was due Groundhog's Day. Um, so excited, so excited. Her due date came, it went. I'm like watching her like a hawk. Nothing is really happening. Like there's not a whole lot of mammary development going on. I'm like, geez, oh man, like I know she's pregnant, but like nothing nothing was happening. Um, and so she went over her due date. I had a wait list a mile long. Like she could have had 40 piglets and I wouldn't have even had to bat an eye to sell them because it was just like everyone was so just enthralled by her, her little story that she had. That first litter, it was horrible. She had awful farrowing dystocia, which is basically stalled labor. She wasn't laboring, she's not pushing, nothing's happening. I had to pull, my memory is like a little cloudy now, but I had to pull the majority of her litter she had approximately 12 as a total litter count. Four were live. One died a day later, not because she crushed it, but it was just something was wrong with it. Um, and one was the tiniest runt that you have ever seen. So I had two and a half piglets to show for that first litter that I had how much money into between buying her, feeding, oh, because this is also me not knowing, uh, bought her, I paid $400 for her because she was older and they're like, oh, she's been with the boar, like we think she's, she's, she's gotta be pregnant. She wasn't pregnant. So I paid so much money for a, turns out, an incredibly obese animal that I also had to trim down. So that first litter, was pretty devastating on the wallet, especially considering that I had to put in all that infrastructure into place for her as well. I had nothing to show for it, except for two and a half piglets that we raised for ourselves. So, hey, I got those piglets that I didn't have to struggle to fight for like, you know, in that spring, uh, that spring litter, uh, you know, crunch time, but certainly was not worth it. Um, but, it's just, it's just, again, one of those things that it happens. The second litter didn't really go that much better because she did much better from a farrowing standpoint, but my farrowing house design, um, because I, I didn't have a me that I have now, someone to be like, please tell me what to do and how to do this properly, and I didn't have like the best setup. There was one gap basically between studs that we didn't do a bumper. And that's where she wedged her butt and she had piglets and basically gave birth in between studs. And I go out there because she farrowed in the middle of the night even though I was like stalking her. I was like, I'm just gonna sleep for a couple hours because she wasn't showing signs of anything. I go out there and there was a pile of seven dead piglets behind her because she gave birth in a corner and they were just crowded on top of each other and suffocated. So second time didn't go much better either. So I doubled down and I lost. So the best way that you can be profitable is to call. And this is the topic that people don't like to talk about because it's icky and it doesn't make you feel good, but it is the number one way to be successful. Bad moms, hard breeders, hard keepers, if that animal is constantly getting sick and you're always having to treat it for something, it, not every animal is suited to be breeding stock. There is a reason there is the saying, you breed the best and you eat the rest. It is there for a reason. We want superior stock, not inferior stock. So make the hard decisions and call because all it's going to do is benefit you. It's gonna benefit the species and the, you know, the breed uh, if you're you know, doing purebreds and stuff like that. So um, hard breeders, hard keepers, tiny litters. If she's throwing you six, it costs the same amount to AI her or the same amount to feed that, sorry, to feed that boar year round to get six as it does for 12. 
only you're getting half as many piglets. So uh, it's, just, it's just not worth it financially. It, do, it just doesn't make sense. Also, bad moms. No ifs, ands, or buts. Get rid of the bad moms. Nothing makes life harder than a bad mom when it comes to livestock. And again, people, sows are kind of notorious for some unsavory behaviors. Uh, so if you happen to have one of those, just I mm, don't even, don't even. It's not even worth the headache. When you get into the, the big pigs, like the girls that I raise, um, Farrowing twice a year is the most, is the best thing that you can do for the animal from a production standpoint, and it is also going to aid in your profitability. So I farrow personally spring and fall. Spring market is hot, hot, hot. Everyone wants feeders in the spring. Fall, a little bit more difficult, but even, I know some people might be thinking like, why would you want to raise pigs in the winter in the north? Actually, a lot of people do because all you have to worry about is really is the water and keeping it you know, from freezing, which is a very easily solved problem. You don't have to worry about heat stress. You don't have to worry about wallows. Ground is frozen. There's less disturbance. There's less rooting. There's less um, erosion, whatever it may be. A lot of people actually really like it. And a lot of people, they do get... Oh, geez, I realized I completely talk, forgot to talk about supplementation. Um, but a lot of people do still get, like, their grocery store surplus throughout the winter. It's like a year-long thing that they get. Well, if they don't have the animals in the winter, for instance, then they're going to be getting all this food from the store, and, like, what are they going to do with it? So a lot of people that I know, actually, they raise them year-round. They don't just do only spring. They do spring and fall because they still get that consistent supply of, of surplus year-round. So, um, aside from uh, that, if you are going to be maintaining breeding stock, if she is not pregnant or she is not lactating, she you're just paying to feed her for, for essentially nothing. She, they're also way more likely to get over-conditioned. They're also likely to get cystic. And there is a correlation between annual farrowing versus uh, biannual farrowing and lower, smaller litter sizes. So if you're only gonna be breeding once a year, you're probably going to be seeing decrease in litter sizes as well because of the fertility aspect. So um, like I said, sometimes you just don't make as much in, in the fall as you do in the spring. A lot of, some people, I can't say a lot, some of the people I personally know, they've, they've increased their spring prices even more to offset so that they can sell their fall piglets for less. I personally don't do that, but in the grand scheme of things, the way I see it is as long as she, the cost of maintaining that sow and feeding that and breeding that sow for that litter is covered and I do have some extra, even if I'm not, I'm certainly not as profitable in the fall as I am in the spring, but as long as I'm not losing money, then to me, it's like, okay, it's, it's, for me, I see this as almost like the cost of doing business for what's best for the sow from a longevity and a production standpoint. Um, I, my personal thing too, again, this kind of comes down to like, what is profitable to you? I always take profits. I, from my fall farrowings, that pays for all the hay for my ruminants for the winter. My Jersey cow, I use her milk to help offset feed costs for my pigs. She saves me money on feed for them. They, in turn, produce babies that pay for her hay and for my sheep. So my animals take care of themselves, or take care of each other and themselves. So for me, that is what makes my, that's what makes my homestead work, though. That's not the case for everybody. That's not everybody's goal. But for me, as long as my day job that I have 
I am not taking money out of my paycheck to go towards buying feed or this medical thing that I need or this water barrel or this, that, and the other thing, then for me, that is a win. That is a major win. For me, I'm doing great if that is the case. And so, that to me, but that's just me, again. Another thing that you really need to take into consideration is what is your market like? So I, like I said, I live in uh, New England and for me, for the very average like going rate for just like Heritage Cross mutts like I raise is $150 for a wiener. Where I am from in Northwest PA, they go for $40. That doesn't cover the cost of feed, to feed the animal. So in that scenario that we talked about earlier, that you're you know, over $1,000 into cost just to feed the gill and get her through lactation, if she had 10, which is like a really admirable size litter for a gill, if she had 10 and she weaned 10 and you sell them for $40 a piece, $400, you're negative $600 plus right there off the cuff. So for some people, it simply does not make sense. Not because you don't love it, not because you don't have a great sow, you could have the best breeding stock. But if you have a terrible market, it, it may not work for you. Even if you were like, okay, well I'm, I'm at a loss here and I'm gonna take it a step further, I'm not gonna sell them, I'm gonna grow them out and I'm gonna raise them and I'm gonna butcher them and I'm gonna sell the meat. Well, I mean, I, I'm not your girl to help you in that situation, but just keep in mind, you're going into that with debt that's carrying over from Fairwing. That's like trading in your car, going upside down to buy a new car. Doesn't make the most sense. So you just need to be very mindful of those things. One of the women in my Patreon, um, she is in the Midwest. This is a struggle that she has. She has a, a great now sow, um, and she had her first litter, and she was struggling to get to offload piglets because she, uh, she has a Gloucestershire old spot um, that she crossed. She bred AI, and she's like, everyone here is used to paying forty dollars for pink pigs. Nobody wants these heritage crosses. She's like. If I'm going to give it one more try, next, she finally unloaded them, but it, it took longer, um, which, again, more cost if you're going to have to hold these piglets over and feed them. And so she's like, I'm going to give it one more try, and if, and if I can't get rid of it, it's not easy, and it's, it's this hard again. She's like, we have no choice. Like We're just going to have to butcher her because we're losing money. I, I can't afford to give piglets away just because I love this. So... These are all just, you know, things, again, to be, to be really mindful of. And at the end of the day, it's okay to buy feeders and to buy wieners. You don't have to do everything. You don't have to farrow because you want to raise your own pork. Um, again, in the tent early, I was talking to Daniel, and, uh, and I think I thought I knew who they, um, the, who they get their, at Polyface, who they get their piglets from. And I asked him, like, oh, like, do you or, like, have you ever any desire to Pharaoh to finish? He goes, I don't want that circus. <laughs> so it's just, it's one of those things that even a farm like that, they don't do it all. They don't Pharaoh to finish. They put the Pharaohing as, you know, a job that someone else does to be successful at it. It does take a lot of work and it does take a lot of intention and, if you want to do things really well and excel at something rather than kind of like do everything kind of okay and not be really great at anything, sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to make those choices. So, are there any questions? These are my, some of my babies. So, if you put out of your pigs in a large enclosure that's how much natural well? Totally depends on what you have as far as like available. The fantastic, like so my so my sows. I love to. Um, we have some areas of woods that's like super heavily oaked, so we get a lot of acorns. Like usually, get like a super bumper crop like every other year. Um, so it is a great supplement, um, but. And I'm so mad, I somehow missed that point on my thing. Uh, so as far as breeding stock goes, we're talking about breeding stock, right? Here, not. 
Oh. oh. Repeat the questions. Excuse me? So his question was how much, like, basically can you offset with forage? Uh, so if you raise them in a woodlot, for instance, he was saying he has hickory, he has oak, so all kinds of, like, nuts, you know, hickory nuts and stuff. So I, without knowing, like, doing math and having, like, a amount per pound of, like, whatever animal you have and how heavily, uh, how heavy the forage is. I, I can tell you it's great. It'll help. Um, is it going to make an astronomical earth shattering change in your feed bill? I don't know because it depends on, again, the density of that forage, how many you're running, all that stuff. I always kind of look at some of those supplementations as, especially it depends on what it is because pigs have some pretty specific uh, dietary needs because uh, they're extremely prolific animals that grow very quickly and they can grow very big and you don't get that way because you eat peppers and lettuce uh, so they do have some very very high demands as far as that goes especially when you get into the breeding stock so supplementation is really great as ways to like offset and stuff but you know we had drought and it's like there were no acorns you can't count on it always, you know what I mean? So you can look at it as icing on the cake, you know? So again, but it depends on your forage. I personally really bank on that milk from my Jersey cow though to help offset those costs for my sows when they're in lactation, absolutely. But that is also, I guess, something terrible could happen and you know she could die or something like that. But that is a little bit more of a consistent and dependable source for me. Um, again, I, I know plenty of people that get, like one of the women that buy her farm, they buy feeders from me. And she's like, oh, I think we're like gonna be able to get like some, something has to do with like granola. It's like some byproduct of granola um, that they're gonna be able to get. But you really need to just bear in mind that, that you are messing, if you're gonna be cutting grain, you're messing with the TMR, the total mixed ration. And again, you just ultimately need to make sure that your animal's nutritional needs are being met. Because if they're not getting lysine, for instance, like they're not going to be growing very well. Um, so you just need to kind of, have you ever raised pigs? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is going to be definitely something that you're going to want to, you'll experiment with. You're going to see. I personally love to finish like pigs in an acorn heavy area because I, I love what that does to the meat personally. Um, so for me, I would either be out there with my, that like nut weasel thing that you wheel around and I'm like filling a big bin for it. Or if it's like on a weird path, like our road has like a lot of oaks. So I'm like, sweeping the road, vacuuming the road, walking up and down, like stockpiling it, um, or just like turn them into the woods. So for me, that's more of like a, yeah, sure, like it's adding great qualities as far as like they're getting some more out of it as far as like that goes. But for me, it's more like, mm, this is like a flavor profile thing that I would not be getting from just grain alone, for instance. So there's a lot of ways to kind of look at it and it really just all, it all depends. <laughs> I know that's a non-answer answer, answer, but it really does all depend. I live here. Okay. A lot of grass hay is available and older stuff for twenty dollars a round bale. How's that for bedding? For bedding? As long as it's not moldy or spoiled, hundred percent. I actually bought um, because the, one of the areas that we had my sows in this winter, I actually specifically wanted them to have hay there so that they could spread it out and we could drag it out or spread it in their bedding, break it down, and then in the winter, be, or after winter, because we knew we were gonna be moving their, their winter shelter, we wanted to come in with the York Grake and spread it for seed. I, I go uh, to my hay guy and I was like, hey, I was like, I need, I need a first cut, whatever, and he, um, 
I was like, okay. I was like, oh, this is really nice. My, my pigs will love this. He's like, this is way too good for pigs. Um, but it, it does. It makes great bedding, especially if you're going to be, depending on, you know, your, your plan or what you have as far as, like, your layout. Like, for us, we're constantly trying to build more pasture. And so, like, let them give it to them. Like, let them rooted in they're going to trample it into the soil it's full if it's first cut it's full of seed heads and you're going to be amazed at the grass that grows there the next year so as long as it's not moldy or spoiled and like hot you know seeds expensive <laughs> absolutely So again, that's a million dollar question. First, it really comes down to you and your own personal, like how hard nosed are you about calling? Um, Cause some people will just be like, all right, your litter sizes are consistently dropping or you're having more issues, but I'm just gonna keep breeding you kind of a thing. So, and also depends on, um, again, like I was talking about nutrition. So my sow, Jenny, I know I keep referring to her. Um, I, I've learned some really like hard lessons the hard way. And one, one, and this is the reason why I'm such a nutrition like crazed person is Jenny as a guilt was on a different feed than I feed like than I've even fed like a couple years ago. And it, because I didn't understand all of the things that go into the guilt development stage and how that affects the long term uh, production and longevity of a sow. So she was getting like a typical like feeder ration because I was raising her alongside um, two of my other, two of her siblings um, for meat. And long story short, she did not get what she needed from a mineral, strong mineralization standpoint, mainly calcium and phosphorus. With every lactation, she's getting more and more knock need. And so she's still fine, she's still mobile, she's every, you know, all that stuff. She will have to be called because of lameness or because I know she's gonna go lame. Um, I'd be, I, I say this all the time, but I, I'd, I'd hedge a bet before from a production standpoint. Um, and I have a, my sow, right, two of the sows that I said that I bred before I came here, one, it'll be her seventh litter, sixth, fourth. What, these numbers made no sense. Uh, seventh, sixth, and fourth. They have, sh I do two a year, yep. Um, and so neither of them, like, the one that set, you know, seven, it'll be her seventh uh, litter, like, she has not shown one sign of slowing down. Um, all depends again though, genetics are a big part of it, but also just nutrition and care and it's, it's all about the longevity because yeah, they, uh, the longer that they stay in the herd and they're productive, like that's, you're gonna be more profitable without having that turnover, you know, having to do the replacements. So, but it, it really does depend. Um, I've, I've certainly seen many that it's, they've had a dozen litters, you know what I mean? So, but it, but it all really does depend. You had a, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, what was your success rate with AI and, and how did you learn how to do it? How did you learn how to win exactly my answer? Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, I kind of, so when I first did it, there were real, there was really nothing out there on it. And um, like I read about it, I'm like, well, this sounds like it's kind of attainable for me. And so like I watched a YouTube video and I tried to watch as, or re like read as much as I could on it. Um, truly like kind of winged it, self-taught and I had success. But since then I've, um, so as far as like success rate, I have had some, no breeds that I've been able to attribute to a, an, a specific cause. So for instance, I have one sow that was not settling and I was just like, oh my God, like, so the, just like something's wrong with her at this point. Well then I finally like opened my eyes and I realized that she had some kind of infection. So she wasn't settling. 
So I flushed her, bred her the next cycle, and she settled. Um, uh, one other sow, um, this was before I got like a cosmetic fridge to keep my semen in. Um, we got like really hot temperatures, and my semen got too warm and killed it, so she didn't settle. Aside from those very specific scenarios, I have actually a 100% success rate. Uh, I said that that's an average. It's, it totally, totally depends on the individual. I have gilts and sows that, like, their standing heats are ridiculous, like 60 hours long. So you have to play, play with the interval um, or, or the number of doses, depending on how long they, they personally stand. So if you wanted to do three, then you would have to have a really good handle on her, her heat cycle and either delay that first breeding or delay um, or keep a wider time in between your breedings. But I, I literally just taught an online AI class. Uh, when was that? A month? Um, yeah, was it March? OK. Yeah. Oh, yeah, because I did it before I bred back the gilt. Yeah, yeah. So I actually did an AI class online on it. So I did record it. But it's, uh, I might do another one in the fall. I, don't, I haven't decided yet. It, it was something I was like, all right. It's like the McRib. It's here and then it's gone, you know? So uh, I, might, I might do it again depending on interest. Um, but it's, <laughs> I am a nerd, all right? So a huge nerd. So I can talk to you about hormones all day long. Um, so there's a lot that goes into it. And it can be as fascinating or as boring as you want it to be. But as far as like the heat tracking and stuff like that goes, like the, it, once you get it, and it, it depends on the individual and how strong a heat cycles they have, which is a call factor if you want fertile myrtles, then um, yeah, that's, that's something that you want to be very mindful of in your selection as well. I saw hands. OK. So if they're just, uh, it all depends on like what you have in your area and like species of trees and stuff. So for instance, with the wood chips, we get just from uh, tree trimmers in our area. So we have heavy maple and oak, which is fine for pigs. Uh, what I said that was toxic was like wood shavings. If you're getting those, say, from like a, a lumber yard or something, if they're, and, and the only reason I said this is because of like pressure treated. You always need to be mindful of, especially with pigs, because they love to chew on things. Um, just be careful about any exposure to pressure treated or, or things that are treated with that with chemicals because they could ingest that and it, and it could make them sick or cause issues. So the question was if you want to buy bulk feed, but like I said, it can spoil, so you got to be careful about using it, how long. Um, so it depends on your where you live and what you're here. Okay, so I don't live here. Um, that's the problem, is we get humid like two months a year, and so it'll be like July and August for us. Um, I would say... I, you know what, I, I don't even want to put a number on it for you because I don't live here and I, I genuinely don't know what it's like, but it, it, it can certainly, the cool, cool and dry, as cool and dry as you can possibly keep it, whether that be like in a garage or if you have like a bank barn and it's like, you know, built into the side and it's a bit more temperate and, and mild year round, put it in the coolest, driest place that you possibly can. But honestly, I, I don't want to put a number on it because I can't and I don't, I don't want to mislead you. Um, and it, it, again, it depends on how fast you're going to go through it too. So I saw another, yep. Where are you from in Pennsylvania, Are you from Northwest PA? Greenville. Ah, I'm, some, I'm from Sagertown. <laughs> You're just right down 79 from me, right? Yeah. Anything else? Ultrasound. 
No, I actually do my own ultrasound, but I don't use like a visual. I use, it's called a preg tone. It's an ultrasonic ultrasound. So rather than getting a picture, it detects amniotic fluid. So it will, it'll give, basically it, when it makes contact, it beep, beep, beep. And then when you detect amniotic fluid, uh, you'll get a solid tone. And so that's the only thing that I have ever used and it's, it's never been wrong, but you do have to be careful about placement because what it does is it detects fluid. So if the uterus is in a pretty specific spot, but some people they're like, you know, fishing there and that probe might make its way a little bit back and it's like, oh, no, nope, you're hitting the bladder. Uh, so you have to be very mindful of where you point it, but it comes with instructions and all that stuff. Uh, they actually do make a pig specific preg, preg tone. Um, it's cheaper than like the multi-species one, which is the one I have because I also used to have goats and it works in like small ruminants and stuff, but of course now I don't have that. So it's like, well, well whatever. I bought it so long ago. Um, but you could also always just do, especially if she has like wildly strong heat cycles, the absence of heat is gonna tell you as well if she's pregnant or not. She doesn't come back into heat, you know, then that's how, that's how most people do it, so. Is that it? Yep. Are those These are my pigs. See that uh, big lady on the right? That's Big Marie. That's the one that had all the stillborns and all of the, uh, the sad pharaohings. So that's her. But to her left is Claire. That's her daughter. Uh, to Claire's left is Bree. That's Claire's daughter. So that's Big Marie's granddaughter. And then on the far left is Jenny. That's also Big Marie's daughter. So my nice little family. So I'm now down to Marie is the matriarch and my three gilts that are currently pregnant. Two of them are Marie's great granddaughters and one is her granddaughter that is Jenny's daughter. So little my little Sow family. Is that it? All right, thank you so much.